Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good something. Um, how many of you have seen enough workflows today? Can you see one or two small workflows more before we go have a beer? I know that I'm standing between you and the beer, but um, I've got a, a, a great topic and I'd like to sort of set the scene. Um, I'm going to have a lot of help with this one. Everybody thinks that Phil just stands up and does this. It's not true. It takes a lot of work from a lot of people. And so we're getting a few more headsets uh, on and I'll begin. Could I ask a question while they're getting ready? How many of you are at your first NIME summit? Let me see your hands. So you just keep hearing this Phil thing, right? Well, it's actually not true. I've been doing this now. I think this is number seven. And we have a tradition of trying to cover hot topics. Now, what I'd like to do while everyone is getting ready is give you a little bit of an overview of the hot topics over the last five, six, seven years. Now remember, when I show you the hot topics, every hot topic has working examples, public data, and a white paper behind it. So if there's something you haven't seen before, you haven't missed it. So what's the idea here? Well, the idea is, if my pointer works, ah, I have to do it that way. What we do is we try to take weird data sources, we take different techniques, we take data, that's the job of the data scientists. My job is to come up with the music. And here's some of the topics we've covered over the last years. And when you guys are ready, just come up and have a seat and while I show them a few things. Back in 2012, we were combining all sorts of data about text and networking. It was fascinating. Today it's considered a normal topic, but that was the first time this had been shown in public. Then we took a next step and we took a look at some of the things here. And we said, how do we take time series and combine it with machine learning? Two areas that people don't normally combine. The next year, already back in 2014, we were talking about IoT. Public examples to show you how you could pull data out of IT, IoT and do things. Then, we had an interesting one. This one was hard because there'd never been public data. This public data came from Siemens. Siemens, thank you again. We were doing the first examples of predictive maintenance that you could repeat. Really cool topic. A couple of years ago then, came something that was close to Michael's heart. And it was this topic. The very first time that guided analytics was talked about. Yes, people are talking about the hottest job, but we were talking about how do you actually bring machine learning and everything to end users. And you see, we've worked on this topic ever since. Because of this presentation, and this music, of course, the Gartner Ga Group now uses this as their standard definition. So we know we're always a little ahead. Last year, I got to have a lot of fun with Iris as we went and did the model factory. And we've really come a long way. You saw Greg and the team this afternoon talking about the model factory and what can be done. This was really bleeding edge, where we went beyond. So then we had the problem, what are we gonna do this year? And, and basically, this presentation is Rosaria's fault. She and I talk about ideas all the time, and we're always thinking, okay, what are we gonna do? And she said, Phil, I want to do this. I want to do this, I want to do this. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I got mad. I got really mad at the industry. I was really mad at the industry because there was so much, um, might I say BS? Uh, there was an awful lot of fear, uncertainty, doubt, 
all sorts of things. We're hearing all sorts of things about something called Dr. Watson. We're hearing all sorts of things called Einstein. We're hearing all this stuff about bots and AI and all of this stuff. And I thought, no, it is time that we bring things down to reality. So if everybody will grab their little hat here. Oh, you can turn the music up a little bit. You are allowed to sing along to the music. Because what I want to do is very straightforward. I want to go and take bots and take a little bit of this AI and bring it back to reality and show you what you can do with Nime. Leave those kids alone. OK, everybody knows the closing line. Are you ready? Excellent. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take bots, we're going to take AI, we're going to take a lot of these topics, and we're going to take a topic that's been around, as Michael said this morning, for a very long time, and none of us are using it. And we're going to give you some examples. So on the stage with me, at the front, uh, we've got, uh, uh, over in the corner, Rosaria. We've got Katrin, and we've got Vincenzo. They did the real work. I do the music. Are you ready? <laughs> My first question for you today, what is the history of a bot? When was the first reference to something like a bot? Can I hear some examples? Uh, what do you think? Five years ago? Uh, Terminator, so that was you know, 15 years ago, something like that now. <laughs> yeah, we're getting old. Anybody, any other suggestions? Yeah? It actually was first referenced in 1950. He didn't call it a bot, but he used the exact definition. And it was Alan Turing himself in one of his famous papers where he talked about Artificial Linguistic Internet Computer Facility. This man was brilliant. He was talking about this long before even I was born. And that's a long time ago. So the concept of a bot has been there. Let's make sure everybody's got the same definition. Because in the industry, in the newspapers, everybody's talking about this in different ways. What is a bot? Here's my best definition. A bot is software designed to automate tasks that you would do yourself or that others might do for you. Now, we all know examples of nasty bots, you know, that are crawling the web and, you know, fake news bots and all sorts of nasty bots. But even the nasty bots, this is what they're trying to do. I'm not focusing on nasty bots. Today we're focusing on positive bots. Here's just a little list of positive bots that I see going on. Um, out in the world, and I think there's going to be a lot more of those, particularly if you understand what's behind them. So we're going to build a bot and make it smart in Nime. You ready? Here's what we're going to start with. OK, this is one of those questions where if anybody doesn't put their hand up, they're probably asleep. How many have used Google search or Bing search in the last 24 hours, right? We all use search, right? And we all know that that is a human search process. Just a couple of things. If we were to make this a pictorial, how does it break down? I have a question. I can't just ask, say, Google the question. I have to break it down to a series of keywords. I press the Enter key. Google goes off, uses an index and some fancy things, comes back and gives me some answers. I then have to look at that answer and say, OK, is, is that what I'm looking for? And if not, I have to do it again. And maybe I change my keywords, and I do it again. And I'm still, I'm getting closer, but basically, I'm having to change it around. This is really bothering me. <laughs> and we keep going through this. And so over and over, this is the human process. And we do this every day, don't we? Yeah? Everybody does this every day. At the end of the day, one of two things happens. Either I get the answer I wanted, yes, I now have my answer, I now know. Or I say no, I get really angry, 
um, I throw something at the computer and I go have a beer. Because this still happens sometimes. So this is the process. We're now going to take that process and do something interesting. The challenge with Google is, have you ever thought Google just really didn't understand you? Well, there's a wonderful example by Paul Shapiro, who, by the way, is not only one of the gurus of search marketing, he's a huge Nime fan. And he talks about this Jewish holiday that Google does not understand. What is that holiday? Can you say the word? Hanukkah? Hanukkah? Now, where does that word come from? It comes from the Hebrew. How do you spell it in English? Well, actually, there's a whole list of words that spellings of the Hebrew word Hanukkah. And he's got this great article that says, you know, this is actually really easy, but Google doesn't get it. So even for simple things like search, we have a problem that no matter how s smart the interface is, there's a challenge there. Now, I would say at this point, oh, we must need data science. And since I'm not a data scientist, I get to turn over to Rosaria. Rosaria, tell us, what's behind this? OK, so um, all of us here, we have worked on a data science project, right? Everybody knows how it works. We have a data set. The data set is labeled. Uh, we, get, uh, we split the data set into training set, into test set, we do some data preparation, we train the model, we apply the model, we score, and it's finished, right? That's how it works. Well, uh, that's how it works maybe on Kaggle or on some very well-defined problem that's not real life. So let's do a reality check and let's see what real life problems look like. In real life, you get a data set where there are no labels, Sometimes there are not even the classes, so you don't even know what your goal is. Uh, of course, tons of missing values. Um, sometimes you have enough data, sometimes not. And the problem of not having the classes is that you cannot even do the training, because what do you train against? So either you resource to uh, clustering, or you build your own ontology, right? So we decided to build our own ontology and to label our own training set. Um, now I have here a long uh, ontology definition. I'm going to be short. I'm going to start from the Greek philosophers. And uh, uh, well, no, the ontology is just an, 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 a set of entities. And if you talk in computer science, it's a set of entities with names and types. So that's all it is. Uh, th those are two uh, famous examples of ontology. That's an anatomy ontology, and that's the, uh, an animal classification ontology. Um, so the, the concept of ontology is very easy. It's a set of classes. It's a set of entities. The time it takes to build an ontology, not so easy. Uh, for example, to get these two ontologies, it took centuries, so something like that. So I hope we are going to be faster with, that, with this project. <laughs> OK, so if the real problem with all of this automation is that, there's, that we need an ontology, sometimes there is an ontology. There's a, there's a number of famous ontologies out there on the market. It's taken years for them to be built, but they're pretty good. The problem comes when we don't have any sort of smarts or, or AI or an ontology. How do we actually go about building this? Well, this is what made me decide to do this topic with Rosaria. In the old days, what you did was, if you needed an ontology and you didn't have one, you took people, you put them in a room, and they started asking questions. Now, I was laughing that this was the old way of doing things until I read an article by Tom Davenport a couple of weeks ago. And he talked about a hospital having spent $60 million because they didn't have an ontology. And they went to a famous company. And that famous company used modern AI. And in the end of the day, that is again what the company did. They put hundreds of people in a room, and the project failed. And this is what me got so mad, because this is a very famous three-letter company um, that 
Um, their product is called Doctor, and I won't say the other bit, but you can imagine, it really, really got me angry. And I thought, okay, we've got to do this. So we are going to give you how to build a basic ontology. And we're going to use a topic that we all know and love. And it's all going to be about, I want to learn NIME. Now, for some of you, you're maybe like me, maybe you came from a different background and you don't know the NIME terms or the language or your experience or a lot of the different things that you would use when you type in questions, that's not necessarily going to be the words that NIME automatically uses. So we want to go through a process and build this up. On the left-hand side, I represent the stupid user um, and to give us lots of information for those stupid users, or the ones who don't know NIME very well, we're going to use information from the forum. We used four years of data from the forum because that's real life. That's all the questions that come in. People don't use the right language in asking the questions. And on the right, there's some great resources. So our first step is going to be building an ontology. And back over to, well, sorry, to tell us about that. So the first idea was to have a question. Uh, we used the, uh, the nine forum data, uh, data questions to, for, as our training set, right? So the first idea was we get a question, we uh, pair each question with a, a web page on our website, a tutorial web page on our website, right? So there must be an answer, and the answer must be a, one of the tutorial material that we have. Well, that's not correct. So usually, if you have a question, you, it takes two or three, four uh, uh, web pages, uh, the content of two, three, four web pages to give the answer for that particular question. So actually, we moved from uh, a one-to-one -one matching, so question URL, to a one-to-many matching question, a set of web pages, of a set of tutorials. So we started, to build our own ontology, we started from the e-learning course. We have seven chapters there, and we, de we decided that the seven uh, chapters, uh, the topics of the seven chapters were seven classes, would correspond to seven classes. So we, pa we start with installation, data access, and all the, the classes. Then we know that people are also accessing other pages to learn about use cases and text processing and image processing and all the other things. The hard way, we also learned that there are a bunch of other answers that people can give on the, uh, on the NIME forum. And uh, those were about uh, development, integration. Integration means the integration of R and Python script mainly. Uh, optimizing NIME, so how to speed up NIME, how to optimize the memory. Uh, life science questions. Then there are those announcements that don't require any answer. And then, of course, somebody reporting a bug or somebody asking for a legal license question and something like that. So those were the, the classes that we learned uh, after a few uh, running, a few iterations of the system. So, so one of the things that you talk about is this thing called active learning. And one of the things I realize is most of us have heard the term, but we don't know what it is. Now, we're going to use active learning. And so I asked Rosaria to just spend a minute and give us a high-level understanding of what is active learning, because I want to make sure everybody gets it. So now we have the classes. We have the questions. We have to label the questions with the classes, right? OK, uh, so there are two ways to do that. The first way is that we hire a student. We lock the student in a room, and then he's going to do click, 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 until he gets all the, all the questions labeled with the right class. That's, of course, uncomfortable for the student. We don't want to do that. So the second option uh, would be to uh, extract a subset of the data, somehow uh, label the subset of the data, and somehow extend this um, subset, these labels of the subset of the data to the rest of the data set. And that's what active learning is. So we start from a data set. The data set is going to look something like that. I put in there four classes, but they are, of course, unknown at this stage of the uh, process. After that, we try a first attempt at class labels. Usually, this is an unsupervised attempt. It's based on distance. It's based on some clustering procedure. So whatever you want, first attempt at class label. And it's usually wrong. Usually, there is a, uh, one class that dominates all the other classes. So don't put too much um, faith in this first attempt at class labels, right? 
Anyway, that's what we have, wrong or correct. That's the data set that we have. We train a model on that. We then extract a, sm a small subset from the original data set based on the conclusion of this model. We have decided to extract the samples with the most uncertain predictions from the model. And this would be, let's say, the top 10% or the top 5%, the lowest, the most uncertain 10%, the most uncertain 5%, and so on, right? So it's a much smaller subset than the original data set. At this point, since the, the subset is small, we can ask the student that we have locked in the room before and by now is petrified, uh, we ask him to uh, label this small subset of uncertain samples, right? And then we are going to end up with something like that. We are going to have the original data set with a few frontier points that have been manually labeled by the petrified student. And then after that, uh, we are going to extend these few manual, uh, manually obtained labels to the rest of the data set. Even here, there are a few possibilities, and anyway, we'll talk about that. Um, so at, at the end, we are going to end up with a data set where the manually labeled samples have extended their classes to the most, uh, the closest uh, other samples, OK? We assume here that um, close samples belong to the same class. So, and that's what we are going to use in the class label extension. So after that, we go back. We have a nice, a hopefully a nicer data set. We retrain the model, right? We extract the most uncertain predictions again. We ask the usual student to relabel the most uncertain, uh, the samples with the most uncertain predictions. So we extend the label again. We go back, model training again, extract, relabeling, class extension, and so on, until at the end, we end up with a data set which hopefully has the right labels for our uh, model, for our training procedure. Okay, so that's the theory of how we do it, and it's really important because for me, this is how you take NIME and actually interact with it and actually hook it back into the humans who may be able to um, do something for you. We've had enough theory, let's go to actual practice. Do you remember this little process I showed? Okay, well, we're gonna first turn that into a bot. We call this the teaching bot, and I would now like to introduce the father of the teaching bot. <laughs> Vincenzo, come up, you gotta help me here. Okay. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through a little bit of, of a show. Now, now, you wrote this bot for people like me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, simple people. Okay. Um, so, so, what's going on here? So, here, basically, we see how actually the teacher bot Emil can help us. So, we are on the web portal and we have two inputs. So the first one is the summary. So we have to write a summary of our question, our problem, right? And then we can write our detailed question. So in this case, it's just an example. So I am having trouble connecting to the SQL server, uh, to a SQL server database. And then, uh, so I wrote in the summary this, and then in the, my detailed question, actually, I'm writing what is the actual problem, right? So I'm saying, OK, I, I'm um, using a database. Node reader to connect to the SQL Server database. I loaded uh, the JDBC driver and configured the node, but I got the following error. Okay, and now you can tell error. I didn't type this question because it's spelled correctly. So this is a question, it's a normal question. Any one of us could have asked this question, right? So I'm gonna click on next, and wow, cool, what happened? Yeah, so now Emily is trying to basically understand or trying to help us in figuring out to uh, what, what is the category that the question that we are asking for uh, belongs to. So in this case, we have a bunch of uh, categories that Emil basically predicted. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, so in this case, we have data access, CTL, data visualization, and also the option something else. Okay, so then I would choose the one that I thought it might have to do with, and I, I could click on it and go to next, and oh, okay, uh, and now I'm seeing links. Right, so this is where actually Emil basically provides us as some suggestions, right? So th those are some links that refer to our NIME resources, and those links uh, basically, they, they may refer to our node guide or some uh, blog post. Uh, so 
what we can do basically is to click to one of those links and check whether the blog post or the note guide uh, can help us in like solving our problem okay. or issue. Okay, so here I get it. So I can go through and I can look, and if I don't like it, I can come back and click again. I can go back. I can keep going back and forth. I can click on the one. And, and basically what you've done is you've automated this process for me at the teaching bot level. So I asked the question once, and I'm going to be interacting with it. Another very simple example of guided analytics. Great. Um, and if the answer is correct? Yeah, well, this is like the thank you page, so where, where actually ML thanks for uh, using the, the, the bot. Okay, and one of the things I like is if I don't get an answer, he actually allows me to click on email, it takes the questions and sends it to a NIME expert. So um, tell us quickly, Vincenzo, what's, what's behind this example? So, yeah, so well, this is the workflow that we have built, and uh, as, you, uh, as you know, uh, many of those red meta node actually corresponds to uh, one of the web pages that we have seen on the web portal. So what we do, we basically start with the first red meta node, uh, where actually we uh, provide the input to the user to write our uh, to write the summary and the detailed question. So what what we have next? We have another red meta node. In this case, so at this step, at this stage, uh, the the question gets processed. Uh, so uh, we actually do some text processing. We extract the keywords, and we do uh, we do a prediction, right? And we try to predict the class or like the, cat the category that we want to visualize in the next web page. So this is the second, the second web page where we have the list of the categories available, and we can choose one of them. So now uh, you see that there is like a, there, there is this if switch uh, node. So this helps us basically to uh, create or like to manage all the conditions, the possible conditions, right? So uh, the, the if switch node gets activated uh, at the bottom output here. If we select the option, uh, the option something else, or uh, one of the category uh, bug or announcement. Uh, in all other cases, it will be activated the uh, upper output here. So let's say we select any of the other categories available. So we go in this meta node here, where we actually concatenate the NIME resources with the, with the node guide. And we filter the uh, resources available with the category that we have selected. If we don't get any empty table, we go in the next, on the next step here. That corresponds to the third web page that actually provides us some suggestions, w which are the links that we can basically look at. Um, so yeah, and then if basically those links are helpful for us, then we, we got to the final uh, page, to the thank you page. Actually, there are a bunch of other options here. So in case, for example, I click the send email button here, I end up to this second uh, red meta node here. So this means that, um, uh, Emil will send an email directly to the NIME support team. So basically what you're doing is you've got your little program control logic in there based on what I click, and it's handling all the options. Right. Okay. Yeah. So there are different and uh, thank you page or like end pages, pages here. Uh, so we control everything with this if switch, and we basically conclude the workflow with some uh, all the end if corresponding to the if switch at the beginning, and then we updated the data set. So this means that we have the two data sets. The one that, so the data that has been categorized with a something else or bug or announcement and all the other uh, categories. Excellent. Yeah. So this is how you put the logic together to help me as a user do that. Now, what's really good about this, we're going to see Vincenzo again in a moment for the next step. But of course, behind this has to be an ontology, right? And as Rosaria said, it's not just a simple search. We have to build an ontology and we have nothing. You do not want me to explain this next section because it's actually data science. So I'm going to ask Katrin to come up and show us and talk for just a minute about this because this is the initial step that Rosario. Hi, Katrin. Oh, I have to explain very quickly. You notice the hats? This is very important for afterwards. Those wearing the black hats, for at my university, black hats mean engineering and science and real. Red hat meant I studied theater, music, 
liberal arts or I was on the football team. So just to sort of put it in perspective here, Katrin knows what she's doing, and as she walks through the example, don't look at me, watch what she's got. Okay, so first we need, of course, um, uh, we have to start with initial labeling so that we have a data set to train a model which predicts our classes. So we start with the initial labeling and then we want to train a model um, to predict the categories. But before we can do so, we have to access our data. Mm -hmm. And in our problem, this is on one hand um, the following questions um, and on the other hand the resources which we have on our website. Um, and to access the data, we decided to use web crawling. Um, and this is actually really easy now in NIME with the Palladian extension. Um, and we need only three nodes to do so. The HTTP retriever node to load the website, then the HTML parser node to get the HTML document, and then at last, uh, last the content extractor node, which extracts the content of a website and creates already a document cell. Um, yeah, and we used the same approach also to um, access the, the NIME forum. And thank you a lot to the Palladian guys for the nodes. This makes life a lot easier than, be than before. I mean, three nodes and we're done. It's in. Yeah. Fantastic. Another really handy note here is also the URL extractor node. Mm -hmm. um, and the URL extractor node extracts all the URLs on a website. So it makes it really easy to, al to do also recursive web crawling. Really cool note as well. So once we have now um, our data, we can start with the initial labeling. Okay, I, I, don't, want another, I don't want another diagram. <laughs> can, can you just go straight to the example? Because you can explain, yes, look, okay. she can explain it much better with this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so the idea of the initial labeling is we read in again our nine resources and the forum questions, and then we apply some pre-processing and we extract the keywords. And then um, we find the, then we label or we find a, a resource which is um, the closest or the most similar one um, to a forum question. So we apply a similarity search for each question to find a resource which has the most matching keywords. Um, and then once we found um, actually uh, the resource um, which, is, which matches uh, based on the distances of the keywords, the question, we apply the ontology, uh, which Rosario introduced in the beginning, and then we write our first uh, training set. So we have now our training set, our first training set, um, which might have wrong labels, but we now can actually train our first model. I want to know why every time Katrin says no clue, she looks at me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get this. What was the deal? But actually, it's she's maybe right. because of your red hat. <laughs> That's right, the red hat. <laughs> Okay, so we have now our first um, training set. Um, so we read back in our training set and split it into a training and a test set like usual. Um, and then we start again with some pre-processing and some keyword extraction. And here I want to point out two nodes. Um, because when we started working on this project, we, we realized that we lose some information, like for example, MS Access um, while using the stop word filter or uh, the normal pre-processing nodes. That's why we introduced the dictionary tagger and we, used, uh, we created uh, a list of all the special tags, so all the special words which we can find in the NIME forum. One example is this MS Access. And another thing we realized while working on this project is that keywords, uh, that we got keywords like NIME or workflow, so all these usual NIME words. But actually, you find those words um, in any question you, will have on the you have on the forum. That's why we introduced this second stop word filter, where we use a customized stop word list. So where we filter out all the usual NIME words, so to speak. Like NIME. Like NIME or okay. Webflow. <laughs> um, and then we apply again this chi-square keyword extractor node to extract the keywords. Um, and before we can now actually um, learn a model, we, cho we have chosen the random forest. We have, we have to transform each document into a numeric representation, and therefore we use the document vector node. And what does the document vector node do? Um, it creates for each keyword which we found in which we have in our training set one column, and then it creates a binary representation of each document with either zero and or one, um, coding whether this keyword is in a document or not. And with this data table, we can now oh. Can I go back? back? Uh, we can now actually train 
our first model, mm -hmm. which I can pass now on to Phil or to Vincenzo um, to start with active learning. Okay. okay, so what we've done is we've gone through and we've gone from no clue and we've actually created something. What's interesting about this is in a lot of the examples uh, available on the internet, um, this is basically where people stop. If anybody has ever worked with ke uh, Kegel data, Kaggle data, yeah? All of this has already been done for you. It's already clean, and you can actually start in with the modeling process. But we are starting with zero. So we have something in here that will give us an answer. And in s there are some cases in the world where this initial modeling is enough. It actually gets us quite far. But I think NIME learning is fairly typical in that that's not going to be enough. And that's where we then go to the next step, which is including this active learning cycle. And if you learn nothing else today, please remember this is the key, because I think there's going to be a lot more of this type of interaction going on in the future as we in machine learning and predictive analytics start working closer with the experts. So active learning. Um, it's back to Vincenzo. Yep. Right. OK, so just to recap a little bit about this. Uh, as R Rosaria introduced a active learning, we can say that, or like we can define active learning as a semi-supervised approach, right? So we start with a data set. Sometimes this data set has only a few of, uh, only a few labels or just wrong labels, right? So we, we first train the model on this training, or, or on this training set. And of course, at, fir at first, this will be like not performing very well. Uh, so what we can do, we can create a subset uh, based on, specific on a specific strategy and then label manually this subset. And so we can, again, take the student or one of us <laughs> and then create actually the uh, active learning cycle. Here we do all the manual labeling. And then what we do, basically, we can then extend the labeling to the whole data set. OK. What, how did we implement this in NIME? So uh, the initial labeling, as we said at the beginning, was done at the beginning with a, uh, what was based on distance. So we used a, a distance-based approach. And uh, we train our uh, data set, our training set with a random forest. Then we created our subset. And this subset was basically created uh, by using the 10% of the most uncertain classes. And what we did basically was to uh, compute the differences uh, between uh, the three top probabilities for each predicted, predicted, predicted class. So then we did basically the manual labeling. So we started with a category assigned workflow where we actually labeled uh, all, the, all the data points. And we had like uh, the classes predicted by, by the model plus the option something else. All the data points that were then uh, selected or like labeled as something else have been there processed again and labeled manually later with another workflow. In the end, we concatenate the results of these uh, two uh, process steps of the of the process, and we extend the labeling to the whole data set. And we did it by choosing basically or assigning the label to the closest uh, data point by using the k and n. So the k in this case was equal to 1. Yep. OK, so what we're doing here is we're actually going to walk you quickly through this cycle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it back over to Vincenzo. You get the idea that he's going to interact with somebody like me first. So I'm just going to let him click through very quickly what the screens look like and show you one or two highlights on the workflow. So go. OK, so this is the workflow that actually allows us to uh, label manually all the questions of the training set. And we have the options, as we have, have, as we have seen also for the deployment workflow. So we have some categories here, and we have the option something else. So for example, in this case, this question refers to our Python integration. So it will be integration. And we can click next, and then we go to the other question, and we label the other question, and so on and so forth. Every this, is, this is more Phil or the student going through and saying, I can match these up. Right. But I might actually click on something else. Right. But at some point, I also say, OK, I'm tired, I'm fed up. Right. 
And this basically ends the workflow. And once I want to start again by labeling all the, all the question again, I can uh, execute again a workflow and start again with a labeling. So, so yeah, so this was the for workflow that we have built. We started by reading the uh, data set or the subset that we have created. And then here in the choose answer, right meta note, we have actually the um, input basically that creates this web page on the, on the web portal. So we, that actually allows us to, to do all the labeling process. Uh, this, of course, is an, an iterative process. So we have a loop here. So once we finish with all the labeling process, the data uh, gets updated. So we update the, the, the data set with the next version of the training set and all the uh, question that gets uh, basically um, categorized with something else they go in another data set that, that will be used later on in another workflow. OK, now the interesting thing about this is, this is going to take care of a lot of them. But at some point, you just don't have the answer. And that's where we then we go to what we call category define. And category define is interesting, because it's actually using a lot of the new features of NIME, one of the things we saw this morning. So quickly show that one as well. Right. So this uses one of the JavaScript view nodes that we have available in the node repository, which is the JavaScript um, view editor. And uh, so what it does here, so basically what we have here are all the questions that we, the, the model was not able to predict well, so we label them as something else. And for each question, we can actually go through and, and then label manually those. So for example, in this case, we have the first question actually corresponds to something related to data visualization. So we can just type here uh, data viz, which corresponds to one of the classes that we have considered. And then the second question actually refers to the R integration in NIME. So there is like R snippet, R nodes. So here we are going to write um, integrations. So we add the label here in, th in the table. And what's important here, of course, is yep. this is the expert. And it's a very, very simple. You can go to the next one. It's, yep. it's a very simple workflow. It's the exact same process we were doing before, all packaged into a nice thing to show what's going on. Right. So basically, here we have the labeling red meter node that shows up the, the table that allows us to label all the single questions that were previously labeled as something else. OK, so what's good about this is, so far, we've gone through a couple of the steps of the active learning. And you can see we've purposely kept this example very small because we want to make sure that you can pick it up and use it yourself, maybe learn some of these techniques. But I'm not quite done yet because I've taken that 10% and I've now categorized it and I've given it some identification. But as Rosaria and um, I think Katrin explained earlier, we actually want to go and now apply that back in. And because, again, this is a data science topic, um, I'd like Rosaria to quickly explain to everybody very briefly what it is we're doing when we talk about extending. So this is very, very easy. So uh, as I said, the assumption is that closed samples belong to the same class. So we use the k-nearest neighbor to extend the manually labeled classes to the, uh, the manually labeled samples to the other samples. Uh, we use the knn, that's the, uh, the workflow, with k equal 1, because with higher k's, otherwise you get uh, the most numerous class to take over uh, the rest of the, uh, of the data set. OK, so what's interesting here is we've now co almost completed the cycle. We're extracting, we're expanding, we're constantly going through that process to make our training set good. And we can run that through the model. And that means our ontology model is constantly getting better as we run this process. And it's actually quite interesting. So what we've been doing is combining a teaching bot with active learning to actually give it some smarts, to give it some artificial intelligence. But remember, there's still some humans behind the scenes there. There's one other thing I'd like to point out before we move on. If you think about it, this teaching bot is also an active learning. Because the way that Vincenzo actually wrote the teaching bot, it captures all of those decisions I made. I like it. I don't like it. I didn't get a good answer. I did get a good answer. And what better knowledge to add back into your active learning. So we've actually closed the loop here. Not only are we doing this with active learning in a separate team, but we're picking up that information and using it appropriately as we move on. Now, 
one of the questions you're going to ask is, how well did this work? We started with zero. And uh, Rosario and, and the team did a few iterations, and they've come up with a few things that they'd like to share. So Rosario, what, we, what did we actually learn? So I'm going to concentrate on only two slides. Um, this slide shows the, um, the class labels and the size uh, says how many samples ended up in that class. So you can see that the iteration zero, we had all installations. Since we have, you remember, right, the initial labeling was made based on distance. So we had keywords for the questions, keywords for the documents, for the web pages. We matched them together based on distance, and then we were assigning the labels like that. A lot of the web pages on the NIME site are actually about installations, how to install stuff, how to install the big data, how to install everything. So a lot of the questions ended up labeled as installation at the first round, which is obviously not correct. Uh, when we moved to the first iteration, things got already a bit more correct, and we have the majority of the questions are about ETL, which is more or less what we would expect. And then we got also a few more uh, topic uh, coming in after already the first iteration. Uh, for example, the text processing becomes much more predominant or uh, because, so anyway, uh, we have also um, uh, the, the image processing beca becomes much bigger, the server, the integrations, and so on. And there is no much difference between the iter iteration number two and iteration number one. What we did between zero and one was also to add a few additional classes that we didn't have at the beginning. You remember, right? The bug, the announcement, uh, the, um, uh, the integration, the optimizing name. So all these classes that we couldn't somehow classify with any of the existing material on the NIME website. And uh, then I wanted to show this, this one. Uh, we are so used to define how good a model is based on accuracy. Is Dean Abbott here? Is Dean here? Okay, Thank he you. probably had a meeting, because this is one of Dean's bugbears, isn't it? He right. just goes crazy when, oh, it's accuracy. Uh, maybe not. So the, the, then what we would expect is that the model doesn't perform well after iteration zero, and that therefore the accuracy should be bad. But actually, the accuracy is not so bad. It stays more or less the same for every training set we feed the model with. So if we give the model something wrong to learn, he does learn it. Um, it's absolutely not discriminatory. So let's see how uh, it actually performs for a real question. This is a question on how it's uh, very small, so if you can read it, you don't need glasses. Um, so this, uh, this question is about databases again and how to uh, install a, a database driver, right? So the, fir the version 0 sends you to um, what was the first one was the workflow coach page, and the second one was the example server. Now, the example serv server is a safe bet. There is everything in there, so for sure there is an answer for this question as well. But we would like to have an answer which is a bit more focused than that. So on uh, the version number two, on the iteration number two, uh, the, the user would, get, would be sent to uh, uh, two blog posts. The one blog post is about the mixing of Twitter and PostgreSQL, and the second blog post is the database gem blog post, where there are six databases, and it's explained how to access each one of them. What's interesting about this is, um, on that last slide, if we're only looking at the accuracy, we actually have to go back and rethink the question. Because the, quest the question is really, how many of our answers are good? How many people that use our bot are satisfied and happy with the answers? And this goes back to something that Dean talks about all the time. You have to make sure your measure of performance is, is correct for the problem. And this is a great example where accuracy is not going to really tell us anything. We've got to use some other measure here. So here we've got, we've combined the teaching bot and the active learning cycle. We've done some really good examples. And so far, though, we're actually just using this as as a workflow. So there's a series of workflows that work together with data sets in between, and we can do this. But one of the things we promised was actually moving this in a very last step, very quickly, to microservices. And you've heard uh, throughout the day one or two examples of microservices. But Katrin, come show us how easy it is to take something like this and turn it into a microservice. OK, so you might have seen that we use um, a lot of this, this meta nodes, not only um, in one workflow, but in many. And the first step, what we did is we created these meta node templates, um, which you can save then in the NIME Explorer. 
um, which have the advantage that once we change something in one of the meta nodes, we have to change it only in the template and not in all the different workflows. This was especially handy um, for the where we for the meta node where we where we make the predictions because there we had to change the model over time. Um, so this is an example of the meta node. But if you want to um, enable um, in addition, also other um, enterprise platforms or devices to use these meta nodes, you can change this meta node into a microservice. Um, and if you want to change a meta node into a microservice, the only thing you have to do is you have to change the input of the uh, meta node into a JSON input node and into a JSON to table node, and the output into a table to jo JSON and a JSON output node. So it's really easy to change a meta node template in NIME into a microservice, actually. Um, and with NIME, you cannot only create microservices, but you can actually also call microservices. And this is nearly as easy um, as creating microservices. So on the top, we see our wrapped meta node, where we first use our uh, meta node templates, so the first one to get the, prob the class probabilities for all the categories. Um, and then we extract the top classes. Um, uh, when we now have our microservices, um, our microservice workflows, we can change this um, and call actually the microservices. And what we have to do therefore is just um, transform our table into a JSON again because our microservice um, expects a JSON input. Then we use this call remote workflow to call the first the first uh, microservice and then the second one. And then in the end, we transform our predictions back into a table so we can use it later. In this example, we used two microservices in a row, but actually you can build your microservices as small and modular as you want, um, and then get a whole microservice architecture. Yeah. What I like about this is, this particular example shows calling microservices on the NIME server. You can see it's call remote. The examples will give you actually will call local work workflow so that you can play with on, on the NIME analytics platform. And remember when you package these things, particularly when they're on the server, there's lots of different things that could call and use these servers. So one of the things we've tried to do with this example is combine teaching bots, combine it with something smart of active learning. I think this is going to be a quite a hot topic and it wouldn't surprise me if some of the analysts groups start talking about it after the conference here because this is something that really brings the smarts of the individual and allows you to pull it in and capture that knowledge and constantly keep moving forward what you're doing. Now what we've tried to do here is show you a couple of things. First, we've created a little basic bot. We've used, uh, that's on the web portal, so using NIME server. We've actually built an ontology from scratch and then actually used an active learning to help robust and keep it moving forward. We've automated the entire process, made it a closed loop, and then we've shown a very quick example of how to do the microservices. What did we learn? Rosaria, what did we learn as we did this? Because as always, we had no clue how this was going to go when we started. We did, we did learn a lot of things. Um, so first of all, well, we got a lot of um, questions why, when we started doing this project. First of all, is the NIME Forum an educational tool? Well, so we thought it was a support tool, but actually we realized that a lot of questions start with, hi, I'm a beginner at NIME. Hi, I'm a newbie at NIME. How do you, do, uh, how do you move from X to Y? How do you change this one? So it's actually an educational tool somehow. Um, we also thought that support is just a search. So you uh, put your keywords in the search box on the NIME web page, and then you find the page that you need. Well, it's not true. First of all, if you put your keywords, you find only the questions that is the closest to your question. If you put the keywords, that means that you already know what your key the, the keywords of your answers are. So that means you already know, you are close to know what the answer is. And that's not the case usually when people ask questions. Um, Right, so uh, at the end, what, what we need in uh, what the, the thing that uh, this, this, uh, the, the teacher bot offers more is that the keyword extraction uh, is a plus also because people, they start with greetings, they build the whole story, they are polite people, they say bye at the end. And if you put this whole text in a search box, so it doesn't find anything. So this, uh, the, 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 the bot offers you um, the keyword extraction as a plus in, in to extract the keyword for the keyword search the model to associate keywords that apparently have nothing to do with the end uh, set of documents. 
Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the things that we, we learned. Another thing that we learned is uh, when you start a new project and you start a new class system and you have new goals for the first time, from time to time you should stop and readjust your goals and readjust your class system because very likely you have overshooted or you, something was uh, not defined correctly. Accuracy is not everything. And then we learned that uh, we need a few more educational pages, either on the blog post or on the e-learning course. Yeah. So one of the, there was a lot we learned from this. And, and one of the things that was fun is um, a little bit of this was trickiness how to put the things together. But now that we've got some examples, we're hoping that you'll be able to get some of these examples and try something yourself on a topic, on ontology topic. It's amazing what you learn when you start getting some of these questions and, and having to match up some of these categories. How could this be extended? Well, the sky's the limit. We've tried to keep this practical, but you could do lots and lots of things. You can see a list here. We could do in tech, uh, in, uh, improve the text processing. We could use word embedding, because sometimes the document vector is not the best way to approach it. We could actually do word, uh, uh, word to vec uh, processing and do something a lot better. Um, we could take it one step further. We were using random forest. We could actually use deep learning to do some more specific things here as we build this up. And we also need to investigate the role of parameters. For our sample, we just ran, we just sort of guessed. But of course, there's a lot of uh, little tweaks we could do to go in there and try to figure out what's lat. Add speech recognition, obviously. We've got some things now in Nime where we can start reading speech and we can start using that as a basis for compiling. So the, this is the basis for doing a lot more things. What's going to happen here is, First, you can immediately have the presentation. It'll be a part of the documentation you get from the NIME user group. Um, there's a series of blog posts. The first one's already appeared. And for each of these four or five major topics, we'll have a blog post with examples that come out. The examples will then be appearing on the NIME server. If you need them right now on the example server, please let one of us know, because we can always get you something early. And at the end of the day, we'll have a series of blog posts and a white paper. What I'd like to do before I show the final music, um, I'd like to just show you, I, I'd like to introduce one last statistical term, inverse proportion. Right? We've got an inverse proportion going on stage here. Who talked the most? in the last presentation? Me. Who did all the work? Those three. So we've got an inverse proportion here of per people who were talking on stage to the amount of work. And I'd like to thank all of them. Can you do me a favor? Give them a huge round of applause. This was cool. With that, we're going to wrap up this session. I'd like to thank all of you. As always, it's really interesting. We have no idea what we're going to do next year. So if you have some interesting topic where you want to combine something cool, something different, pull things together, please find either myself or Rosaria. We're taking ideas for the next time we go about combining NIME in new ways. Thank you very much.